thanks uh, 1871 for inviting me. This is quite um, the homecoming, although I am on the board, it's, it's kind of good to see founders, talk to founders about the work we're doing at Reaply, the, the things I've learned, um, and the things that I hope that um, the lessons I've learned that people cannot make those same mistakes. So really the focus of this conversation really is about how do you create adaptability across a network? And the network I think we're all thinking about are startup companies, humans, as, as we said in our last conversation. So I'm going to take us on a journey of my life of just trying to figure that out. And that journey actually starts in the Midwest. I, I'm a Midwesterner, and I think there's some parts about being a Midwesterner that are important for leading companies, at least in my own opinion. Um, and I came to Chicago a couple moons ago um, to not be in technology. I actually came to Chicago to pursue a PhD in neuroscience. And now, why did I do that? Um, I was super interested. I've always been a lab geek. My entire undergraduate career was in cancer research in a laboratory in the basements at Indiana University. Um, so I just thought like, oh man, that's what I wanna do. I wanna create new matter. I wanna think through hard problems. And as I had taken that year off between undergraduate and my graduate work, I heard from a lot of folks, the best way to do that is go get your doctorate. I literally cold emailed a professor at Northwestern who's very famous. His name is Richard Silverman and he's discovered a drug called Lyrica. And I just said, hey, I wanna be in your lab. And he responded. He said, there's a process for that. You should apply to the graduate school. Um, so my first point about process. But um, so I got to Chicago and um, I actually got in his lab. He actually is an investor in our company, so it's come full circle. Um, but as I came to Chicago and started kind of my career looking at Parkinson's disease and trying to really discover or innovate on a therapeutic measure for people who are suffering from those from that disease state, um, I noticed that I always wanted my work to mean something and to matter. And I think one of the most important things that we try to keep as a kind of North Star at Reapley is why are you doing what you're doing today? If people are disconnected from their why, from their purpose, it's incredibly hard to mobilize a team, including to have them be adaptable to the changing climates of any marketplace. So I you know, did my PhD, did a postdoctoral fellowship, and then I did like any scientist does. I went into consulting, that's a joke. Um, but I did go into consulting because I, what I loved about science, or what I loved about research science was the, the ability to own something, to create things. But what I was missing was the speed, was this impact. And I thought that learning some core business principles, being in the market, could really help me get there. So that's kind of my career before Reapley. I am a science nerd. I've been in a lab for about 16 years. I spent, you know, half a decade in a consulting world. But I bring all, the, all that to say that um, science is my nature. And when I think about science, I think about hypothesis-driven experiments. And so really the conversation I'm going to have today about the open question about how do you encourage the ability to be adaptable, I think that is by having everyone in your organization do hypothesis-driven experiments. Things aren't tasks. Things aren't OKRs, things aren't goals. You're really, in a startup world at least, you're really just testing something. And so the real question is, how do you run good tests? How do you empower people to test? And how do you train people to test? So, um, and the reason this is important, because I think this, this word failure, when it comes to, you know, we had a goal, we had an assumption, we didn't hit that goal, the assumption was wrong, therefore it's a failure. Um, we don't think about that word in science. We don't think about failure. We think about trials, right? We, you know, it's not, we haven't found a drug, we failed at finding a drug, we haven't done the right sets of experiments to find the right drug for this disease state. Um, and so that's a little bit of the framing that we have at Reapley is that, okay, so uh, the big boss, me, says that we need this thing to happen. 
Um, and that thing could be a new feature. Um, that thing could be a revenue goal. That thing could be some kind of people metric that we want to uh, maintain. So then the question is, isn't what are the immediate tactics that help us potentially to accomplish that goal? The question is, why did the boss just ask us that? Like, what's the underlying thinking he has or she has? And why are we going to embark on those set of tasks to help accomplish that goal? And I think this is um, uh, important. I have heard Boya Day talk about his four Ys or his four Ws. And I think for me, the most important is really is that kind of why. Um, and so we spent a lot of time writing very boring internal memos at Reaply about why we're doing something. Um, we, in COVID, went from about seven, eight full-time employees at the beginning of March of 2020, and now we have over 60. And in that growth spurt, we had never been remote. We were all in the same WeWork office in the loop here in Chicago. And so I'd never created the structure for people to be thinking and experimenting remotely. They were all doing, we were all doing one experiment. But then as we started to grow, and then as our team started to become more remote because of the, the you know, the dictates of the quarantine, we had to develop processes that allowed us to keep that flexibility in our team, but also to allow people to uh, pace to the same um, goal, pace to the same vision. So um, one of the things that I like to do is really test people when they bring an idea. And um, it's, it's kind of a, it's almost like a laugh track because when some com someone comes and pitches something to me, whether it be an executive, whether it be a person we hired the other day, I literally just keep asking why, like as a, like a child might do. And what I've discovered in that process is that it's actually best not to just answer me, but to institute those as, and memorialize those into documents so that um, when future people come into the company and they go, why do we build that feature? Why are we selling this way? Why is our market team, marketing team using that word versus this word? Um, it's not that I maintain all the knowledge or our executive team has that. It's just like there's a sec set of documents where we really thought about the why. Um, the, but the other part, kind of once you have that kind of under your belt, is what type of experiments should you be doing to test this? And as a startup guy, especially as one who's... Um, who's, you know, I haven't raised as much money as some of the other Series A, Series B startup founders. I think a little bit about like, how can we do the smallest experiment at the least amount of costs that illuminates that we're running in the right direction? So it may not answer the revenue question. We want to increase our revenue by 50%. We want to retain 100% of our people. We want to, you know, what are those kind of big objectives a company might have in a year? But the question is, did something we do, something that we tested, move us slightly in the direction that leads to potentially more revenue, leads to people attainment or retainment, um, leads to some other kind of goal? And so those are just verifiers. And so when you're constructing an experiment in a lab, you set those off as your hypothesis. I'm going to do this experiment, and my expectation is this dye is going to be green or this dye is going to be blue. And, is, and that's going to tell me something about the, the experiment that I'm running. You don't say, I'm going to do this experiment. And at the end of it, the, there's going to be revenue at the end of the tunnel. Right? So, or we're going to cure Parkinson's disease because we've run this one experiment. So really, I think a lot about being restrained as a leader and saying, I'm going to deploy people and running experiments but they're going to be giving us results or returning results that allow us to know directionally, is this viable as an idea? And is it aligned with the, under, the underlying vision and mission of the company? Um, the other kind of you know, interesting thing kind of moving from the lab into uh, a startup is actually the, the human part. You know, when you're in a lab for 16 years and you're, I mean, a dark lab, and it had to be dark because I was doing a lot of, you know, late laser things. And there's no one around. And it's midnight and you're booming your favorite music. You're not thinking about people. You're thinking about, like, I want to get this experiment done. i got to have this thing written out for tomorrow, whenever it might be. Um, but that's so different in the startup world. 
Because as you're doing an experiment, um, someone else is experiencing COVID. Um, someone else's child is sick or someone else is having some type of um, problem that you might not be aware of that affects the exact experiment that you've asked them to go run. Two, having people do things is an experiment unto itself. So though I might have asked you, hey, can you, can you do these things for me? The fact that you're actually doing and potentially executing on them is as much of an experiment as you actually accomplishing or proving the hypothesis null or successful. So the, the thing that I really never corrected for kind of off into my journey as a startup, I, I, I kind of had a good sense of how to run experiments, but I didn't have a good sense of how to do that where lots of people are doing them at the same time. And then also managing this underlying psyche, the underlying kind of human humanity of those people, um, especially in a kind of upside down COVID world. And I think that the best thing that we've done to really make sure that we're hiring the right folks and training the right folks is institute this kind of hypothesis driven thinking in our uh, hiring process. So whenever someone's, uh, for instance, reporting to me or one of my immediate um, leads, we ask these same questions of like, you know, why did you come to Reaply? Like, what was, what was the thinking behind applying for this job or applying for this role? And we listen very intently to what they say. I mean, one of the folks that we've, we've recently hired said, you know, I was actually looking for your platform. I was looking for a platform like yours. I came to your website and I saw that you were hiring for a position that I love. So then I applied. I thought, oh, interesting. So you actually weren't even looking for a job. You were never seeking us out. You were seeking our product out. And that helps me understand what types of things they're after. They're after joining our company because they're really interested in the product. It wasn't that they were just really interested in, they saw me speak or they, they like our commercials or they like our mission. It's like, no, I really, really love our product. And by the way, this is our, our new head of product, which I'm super excited for her to start. Um, so I think it's so I think there's kind of two things here I just want to kind of uh, double down on. The first is um, I think that from the top down, uh, big goals need to be uh, you know divided into doable experiments for the workforce that you have. I think you have to mandate hypothesis driven, like why you're doing it. What is a test of what will be shown if your your tests are successful? What will be shown if your tests are not successful? And then what will be your next step? And I like to just add in because we are a startup and we have limited resources. What is this going to cost us? Not in just, you know, real dollars, but what is this going to cost us from a time opportunity perspective? Like what things aren't you working on? because you're doing these sets of experiments. Um, how, does, um, how does this play into the larger vision of the company? So just a little bit of background, I'm super about you know, hi hypothesis-driven experience, experiments. Now, how does that play into the topic of agility, flexibility, adaptability for a large and growing network? Um, I think that a company running the most hypothesis-driven experiments win in their market. I think if you can have your entire workforce doing what, at whatever level they are, running some set of experiments that's based in a, in a solid why that is public, that everyone in the company knows with a small budget, um, that, that where they can get to that those answers, I think that you innovate much, much more quickly. And I think you innovate all over the company. It's not just the CEO or some strategic advisor or the head of product has some brilliant idea. It could be an intern who has been thinking about this one issue, has been burning. They've gotten some approval to do a couple of experiments, and then they've shown you, ah, this can work if we put a little bit more resourcing in it or if we put a little bit more thinking in it. So I think one of my hypotheses is that in order to really build a big network that's flexible and adaptable, people should be running experiments every, every place in your business. So then the question is like, how do you operationalize that? Um, I think one of the first things to do is you um, have to reward, reward number of trials, meaning failure is okay. Um, I think, you know, there's different books, different blogs that talk about celebrating failure, failure is not a bad thing. 
I don't know if I ever want to celebrate failure. You know, if you're in the startup world, you want to win. And we're a climate tech company. Our, the things that we're doing literally mean an end to us sustaining the way that we work on this planet. So I got out of neuroscience because I want to win in this space. There isn't anything about failure. But what I want to celebrate is how many times have you tried something? How many times have you tried different things that were hypothesis driven? If, if that's the thing that I want to celebrate, like what's your, what's your motor like, right? You know, and the way that I, uh, we do that is we talk really openly about the things that we're doing in the company. You know, I heard in the last panel, I heard a lot of kind of structure that's, that mirrors ours. You know, we have Monday morning status meetings in the teams. We talk about what we're going to try to get accomplished that week and why we're doing it, what experiments we're going to run. Um, you know, some teams actually meet on Friday in kind of the happy hour, kind of virtual happy hour moment to kind of talk about the things that they've done, the things that worked, the things they have to retry, the experiment wasn't done well, or the things that they have to, they're going to double down next week because it actually did go well. Um, so I would create a, a culture like you see in a lab with just like that kind of business motor, meaning that people are there investigating something. They've come because they're interested in the topic matter, and they're going to be given the agency, the resourcing, and kind of the care and training to be able to go run their own experiments. Um, let me close, or at least close my formal remarks before we get into, to Q&A with um, how I think about this structurally. So one thing is invite people into the ideation, or I call invite people into the room. The, the great thing about being remote is that there aren't doors and floors, right? Buildings were built in a way to, so you could have meetings that um, kind of gave people the right context, the right people in the right rooms. Um, now I just drop into meetings. Every now and again, I'll just drop into a design meeting. I'll just put, I'll, I'll go off, uh, I'll go on mute, I'll go off video, and I'll just listen. I'll be working, working on some emails, and I'll just listen because I'm getting some ideas. I'm hearing them. I might give them an idea, and I encourage that throughout the team if it's a non-client meeting. But you just drop in on another team's meeting, just listen. Um, so the, the first thing we think is that there, there aren't any real doors, unless it's like an HR issue. It, you know, invite people into the ideation of any process, any idea, any experiment. And then once an experiment has been deemed to be something worth uh, pursuing, empower the person, empower the people who are going to be doing that with the resources and with the agency to create it. Um, we have many things at Reapley that were developed by interns that we actually acquired here at 1871. And half of those interns are actually full-time employees at Reapley. Thank you, 1871. Um, and that's because, well, one, we were small, but even when you're a little bit bigger, I think it's important, the workforce that you've recruited, to give them the agency upon a really good hypothesis to go pursue something. Immediately after they've done those experiments, whether successful or not, um, you have to evaluate how that went. Asking questions like, how were things done? Um, having people openly admit mistakes, setbacks, bad assumptions, bad data, we need to run it again, this didn't work this way. And so I think that kind of process of invite people, empower those people, and then get an immediate, you know, some people call it retros, whatever it might be, give immediate feedback where we're all open about uh, kind of what happened, I think is important. I then think it's important to rinse and repeat. One of the, uh, you know, we were, we've been using basketball analogies all day. One of the things I remember from Phil Jackson's days and coaching the Lakers is, you know, a guy's out there, he's missed a free throw, he's missed another free throw, he's missed a layup, he's missed a layup. Phil Jackson's not calling a timeout. He's not taking you out of the game. And as soon as you make the free throw, as soon as you make the, the layup, he calls a timeout and puts you on the bench. So one of the things that I like to do, and that's kind of celebrating trials, by the way, versus success. Um, so one of the things I like to do is if someone has admitted, well, that experiment wasn't good or we didn't do the things that we said we we're going to do, I like to give them more, more time to try to go do that. 
what I call rinse and repeat. Let them continue to do that because it's really not about this individual experience, experiment. It's really about developing a person who has the, the, the ability and the agency to be able to run experiments. Um, and I think as a manager of people, mid-level, high-level executive, I think the way that you know that this is working in your organization, that you know that this is good, that you know that you're becoming more agile and more flexible is not the number of successful experiments. Because I think success in experiments, success in business can be sometimes bounded by luck, right? Like, oh, I, I, I mix these two things together and poof, penicillin. Right. Like, and I can tell you scientifically how that actually works, but the way that we got about that wasn't super rigorous. Seemingly, you know, uh, I could start a business, uh, you know, prior to COVID that had a value to people being remote. COVID happens, poof, I look like a genius. Um, but really celebrating the number of times people are able to iterate, the number of times people are able to make experiments, because that means they're really moving, they're really cranking, they're really working. So we really, I try to really celebrate, we got something done, even if it didn't work. We got something done. How do we get something more done that we now know can work? And so just one of my last comments is that if you can make every fork in the road, every decision in a company that's not obvious, right? I think the executives make, you know, they, they talk about obvious experiments, uh, obvious uh, uh, decisions. But if you can make all of those little nuggets of experiments and then equip and engage your workforce to have the agency and decision making, you create an organization as powerful as anyone, as resilient as any, and as adaptable as any. So thank you for listening. Go do experiments. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. Happy to take any questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, excellent. Thank you. Quick question. I know when you're talking about encouraging agility. Oh, sorry. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Real deep. Um, when you're talking about agility and flexibility, do you do you take into consideration any um, personality mm -hmm. um, tests, examples, traits, or things like that? Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I was just curious about that. I use that a lot when yes. I'm. Um, and I, I'm sorry. My name is James Parker. Uh, CEO founder of 1921 co-working named after Black Wall Street. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at that when I'm looking at startups that we may potentially you know, incubate, like, okay, let me just look at the personality type because kind of the whole, um, uh, uh, it seems to be universal, the whole asshole aspect, mm -hmm. uh, ass, ass, aspect. Um, not having those kind of people, do you take that into consideration as well when you're in, in hiring place? I actually do. And I think, um, and, I, and I would assume, although I'm not in the brain, that most of our managers at Reef we do. And if you think about, you know, uh, an, an experiment with like experiments with animals, for instance, you know, if I had a cage of all female mice and I'm running an experiment that has to do about the stress of female females, and then I have another cage that has half males and half females. If I do those experiments, I might come up with different data that has nothing to do with the underlying condition. It's just that Prior to that, the cohort that was mixed to do the experiments were throwing me off. So I try to take into account, like, so if I'm saying, hey, we're going to run, you know, we're going to try to build, you know, a new platform, a new set of features. Well, do I have a designer, a front end developer, an engineer, a project manager, someone in ops to kind of keep things together? Like, I do think about the construction of like the people who are running this experiment as much as I think about, which I think is the undergirding of your question, their own personalities, like how these people work together. Is this their first time working together? Because if this is their first time working together, maybe the fact that this doesn't work out has less to do with it not working out, just like this is the first thing they've ever done big together. So I think that's a little bit of the manager's role. And what I try to do is just try to say, to poke holes and like, I don't think this is how we should start this. We should add that person or take away that person. And these are my reasons why, what do you think? Because obviously we want to do one experiment and help and make that successful, but we want to um, avoid obvious pitfalls even before we start. So I think, I think people um, understanding their core of them is at the at the base of how you run these good experiments and big networks. 
And I think um, I spend 60% of my time talking to people in our company, calling them at night. How are you and your family doing? Um, you know, uh, we, we, you know, Mother's Day, the things that are happening in the courts, calling all the mothers on the team, like really understanding where people are, especially because we're, uh, we're about 60% in Chicago and, and 40% elsewhere in the United States. And I think that helps me understand like, oh, that person can't take that on right now. Um, even though they might say they can. Um, so I think people is like a, a big part of it, which is very different than, you know, kind of chemicals in a tube in a laboratory. Hi, Gary. Hi. Uh, I'm Katie Osborne. I'm founder of Nowhere Collective. I'm helping makers incorporate reclaimed materials in their goods Yay, so they that. can source materials on the platform Secular. and then sell their goods. So uh, I appreciate everything that you're doing. And I'm curious if you can talk specifically about an experiment that you all ran that you were maybe surprised by the results or that really helped you figure out what the next step might be and how you communicate that to your other stakeholders like your investors and board and stuff like that. Yeah, so um, uh, I'll talk about one that's active. We, we have something called uh, Project Overshare. So, the, so there was a, the hypothesis was, hey, we're growing up as a company and we were at a fork of the road. Do we share things that happen in the board meeting or do we kind of cartel that a little bit away? And then I come up with some statement about like how great the company's doing. Everything's rah, rah, rah. And so my COO had this idea of let's create something the week after the board meeting at like a coming kind of like a company town hall and we're calling it Project Overshare where we literally share both the board deck and the kind of summer, summary comments that were made, um, again, keeping everything HR to the side. And the idea was, does that produce um, an organization that's more well aligned, more purposeful, um, and less question asking to the senior executives because people will have seen all the things that we've presented to our board. And so that was one of the experiments that we ran about a year ago or last summer or so. And um, I, we continue to do that. So uh, I had a board meeting actually yesterday. So next week we'll have Project Overshare where not me, but the CEO will kind of go through the board deck and anyone can ask any question. All the financials, all the numbers are out in public um, and it's been working pretty well. I Last year, of the 60 folks that we had on Team Reaply, only one left. And for the CEOs that I know uh, and the cohorts that I'm in, you know, I've heard about 20, 30, 40% churn. So I'm really, I think Project Overshare is one part of that. I obviously think I love our mission. I love our team. Um, I love the, the work that we're doing. But I think being super transparent is important. We just didn't have a way to do that. And so we experiment it with this kind of like, let's just share literally the board deck and to see what people think. Mm 